and let's get into the Word of God today. Well, first of all, let me share with you what's going on. Um, this past week, we have been running, running. Um, as you all are aware, uh, we suffered a death in our family. I lost my mother-in-law, and we have got through that very well. But there was someone who was in all of those events who actually contacted COVID. I did not get it. Someone in my family did, but I am fully vaccinated. My entire family is fully vaccinated. Now, what the latest CDC regulations say, if you are fully vaccinated, even if you've been exposed, that you really don't have to quarantine unless you have symptoms and get tested. I've been tested twice. I am fine. But I'm coming from home today because I did not have a chance to explain to everyone at my church what was going on. And I figure it will be more of a distraction if I was preaching from church than preaching from here. So you guys spread the word. Pastor Duncan's is fine. Pastor Duncan's does not have COVID. There was no outbreak. But there, I was around someone who contacted it. So that necessitates, thank God, we have virtual. It necessitates for me doing my message here from the house this morning. But God is good. I'm glad you joined me. And I want you to get ready to go into the word of God with me as you're continuing to share this with someone. Go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. We have been doing a, a series of messages during this uh, Advent season that have been dealing with the birth of Christ from a different perspective. So today we're going to continue and preach this last message during this Advent season about Jesus Christ. We're going to preach this last, you know, Advent, this is the last Sunday of Advent, which means that this is the Sunday that represents God's love. And if I got a message for you that talks about the love of God, if you are in Matthew chapter 2, follow me as I read this powerful word together. Do you have it? I'm going to need you to have an instrument, your Bible, whatever you use, because we will be coming strictly from this word of God. Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, I'm going to be reading the King James Version. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born King of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, follow, and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. That's Micah chapter 5, verse 2, another prophecy fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go. And search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard that, they departed. And lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary. When they opened their treasures... They fell down and worshiped him. And when they opened their treasure, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be there until I bring thee word again, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And there they were until the death of Herod. 
that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly angry and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, Jeremiah, in Ramah there was a voice of lamentations heard and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and they would not be comforted. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you today for your power. Someone listening to me, Lord, has been under some pressure. Even though this is Christmas time, supposedly a joyous occasion, it's also the time of depression. It's also the time when people have memories. It's also the time for missing our loved ones. Please, Lord, allow them to seek refuge and comfort in the only place there is comfort. For your word says that you are the God of all comfort. God, you can do it. Let them know you're going to carry them through. You're going to restore them. You're going to bring back that joy, that supernatural, everlasting joy. You're going to show mercy when they need mercy. You're going to give them grace when they need grace. So today, Lord, let them rise up with a new determination as they hear your word. Lord, I ask you to bless me with remembrance and make sure that the word that I'm speaking is a word that will bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to speak from this thought as long as the Lord will allow. Write this down if you can. Listen to the warning. Listen to the warning. Here we go. The RSM Titanic was boasted as the greatest ship that was ever built of its time. It was massive, it was impressive, and it was thought to be unsinkable. And yet, the Titanic, Titanic sank. And the reason it sank is because the captain, Captain Edward Smith, ignored the warning about icebergs being ahead. Did I say he ignored the warning? He ignored the warnings. Do you know that the Titanic received not one, not two, not three, not four, six research says, and maybe seven warnings that there were icebergs ahead? Why did Captain Edward Smith ignore these warnings? Well, some have speculated he did it because of the fact that he had pride. He did it because he had faith in his ability to keep the ship going. He did it because he thought the ship was unsinkable. Whatever the reason, he ignored warnings from several other vessels. Now, what's important about this is movies have been written, books have been written, research has done that shows the neglect that sank the Titanic. And it sank on April the 12th. Well, April the 10th, 1912, the Titanic set sail. And by early mornings of 2015, 1912, after sideswiping an iceberg, the Titanic sank. There were over 2,224 people aboard, counting the crew. And when they sank, over 1,500 people lost their lives. Something that could have been avoided. But it was not because they neglected to heed the warnings. Three other facts I'm going to tell you real quick and then I'll transition so you know what I'm saying. Three other facts that make this story Im Im remarkable. First, another fact is they only had 20 lifeboats on the boat. That means that half of the crew, people would have died anyway if the boat sank. They were not prepared. It Also, the captain went down with the ship. So you need to know that not only that, the captain went down with the ship. And the craziest thing in the world about the Titanic is that after striking the iceberg, this unsinkable ship sank fast, less than two hours, all because they did not heed the warning. What made him ignore all of these warnings? That is the wonder of this Christian, this Christmas message this morning. Follow me, follow your Bibles, understand that this Sunday of Advent, which represents love, I'm going to be talking about a message that examines a timely promise that God has given us that will bless you and wake you up this morning. And that promise is that God always warns and protects his 
people. Everything God does in our life is so that we can live a powerful, a prosperous, and a blessed life. Everything God speaks into our life is so we can have the things that we need. Somebody need to hear me this morning. Everything God allows in your life, it may not look like it at the time, but God is going to use what's in your life. Here's a shout coming to turn your life around if you focus on God and not on your circumstance. What am I talking about? David can help us out. David in Psalms 37 verse 25 to 26 said this, and he learned this after a whole lot of trials in his life. He said, I've been young and I've been old. He said, and yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed begging bread. Can I speak into somebody's life? God will not forsake you. God will make sure you bounce back. God will make sure things are going to happen. David said, when I was young, I was old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. But look at the rest of the verse. Look at verse 26. It says, because he will give mercy and he lends to his people Watch this. And all of God's seed is blessed. I want somebody to just say I'm blessed this morning. I want you to raise your hand in the midst of whatever's going on in the chaos of Christmas. I want you to say today that I am blessed. And once you understand that, you'll understand the reason you're crying you're blessed is because Psalm 68, 19. The psalmist cries out in Psalm 68, 19. Blessed be God who daily loathed his people with gifts, with benefits. Listen to what the psalmist said. Every day when you wake up, God has a list of benefits that he is loading in your life. All you have to do is be in a position to receive them. Can I ask you very, very, I'm asking you very wholeheartedly, please receive your benefits. Please lift your hand and say, God, I know you got some new mercy for me. I know you got some new blessings for me and receive them this morning and watch God bless you. And once you understand that God never lets his people get forsaken, that God loads us with benefits, then you'll be able to shout what we also like to talk about, but you'll understand it from a position of your own personal experience, and that's Romans 8, 28. You know what God does? He uses, turns everything, Romans 8, 28, for we know that all are called according to his purpose. I want you to know all things are working together for your good. If you could just believe that this morning a cloud would be lifted and you would know that God does this so he can bless us in our life. As you notice, the scripture also says all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Understand me. The blessings that come in our life is because we maintain our focus on our purpose. Our prosperity is on is coming from us wanting to build the kingdom of God, wanting God to get the glory. And so we maintain our focus on God's purpose and plan for our life. Holy Spirit just told me to slow down. Somebody wait me to get to another part, but you need to hear that. That's the nugget. Everything God does, the purpose and plans that God has for our life contains the blessing of our prosperity. So what you got to ask yourself this morning is, Lord, how do I get back to my purpose in your life? Or how do I stay focused on the purpose in my life? How do I know that? Ephesians 2 and 10. Come on, write this down. This is some good stuff. He says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that he has before ordained that we should walk in them. I didn't say that too fast. Did I? Here's what he said. We are his workmanship. Our life works when we allow God to work in our life because he's already preordained some good things in our life. Somebody right now, listen to me. Your healing is already preordained. Your deliverance is already preordained. Your blessing is already preordained. Your child is going to get better. It's already preordained. Whatever the enemy said, he can't stop what God is doing because God said, I preordained some blessings in your life. That's why John 15, 17 says, if his words, John 15, 17, abide in us and we abide in his word, we can ask what we want and it will come to pass. When you abide in God's word and God's word abides in you, something's getting ready to happen. Can I tell somebody, get some expectation right now, something is getting ready to happen. God provides all of these things by warning us. What is he warning us of? He's warning us when our life is getting too far away from him. If you had joy and now the same thing you're going through now, you went through before, but you can't rejoice, that means you don't move away from God.
If you could go through some stuff before and now it looks like it's harder, it's harder. It doesn't mean you're getting older because staying with God gets better. It means that somehow you lost the focus of God's plan for your life. God warns us when, when danger is coming. God warns us when, when things aren't going right. God warns us to turn around. He's trying to wake you up this morning. He has you listening to me because he's warning you. He's got some blessings for you. You're about to miss them. You ask for these blessings, but you're so depressed. You're so down. God God can't bring that joy into your life, but God is warning you. I have some blessings for you. That's why this text, this Christmas message, I'm bringing it back to this text, is going to show you. It's going to astound you. I'm going to point out something that maybe other folk have missed, maybe they didn't focus on, but the Holy Spirit showed me. In this one chapter, God warned his people no less than four times. He gave a warning so people could get the things he has for him. What we have to do, our job, is to listen to the warning. The biggest warning God provided for us was sending us a savior to let us know we can't make it without him. So this morning, I'm asking you to listen to the warning. In this great Christmas text, we're going to find out that God, here it is, warns and protects because he loves us. And he makes sure we get where we're going. In this story, the warnings were to protect his purpose. Remember I said our blessings are tied to his purpose. So his purpose is to bless the birth of Jesus Christ. The devil tried to stop it. Herod tried to stop it. But God warned and his son was saved. All I'm saying to you, if you listen to me, you never get depressed. You never go somewhere that God won't first warn you. Hold on to me. God want me to wake somebody up this morning to tell you that the warning today is you moved away from me. You had power before. You rejoiced all the time. Don't let, if you overcame the enemy once, you can overcome him again. Let's look at this text. I'm going to give you three points, but I'm going to go, I'm going to make you flow with me today. I'm not going to give you all three at once. The first thing you got to understand if you're going to listen to the warning, because my hypothesis says that several of us are going through stuff, not taking advantage of the fact that God wants to bless us through it, already taking us through it, but he's warned us that we can get ahead of it. Right now, you can get ahead of the next thing the devil's throwing. You can get ahead of what's going on. What's the first thing we have to understand? First of all, this second chapter of Matthew, it begins with the birth of Jesus after he was born. Uh, so and it wanted us to understand the surroundings Jesus was born into. It wanted us to understand that their circumstances, God already knew we were going to be born into, that he was going to bless us through. Did you hear me? God already knew you were going to be born, you were going to face these circumstances, so don't you dare act like it's the end. God already knew you were going to have to face this, and he's prepared the way out, the deliverance, and everything else you needed, and that's why he's warning you now. Jesus was born so he could fulfill the redemption plan of God so that he could get back for us what Adam and Eve lost, so that he could take us to a place that no matter what happened in our life, nothing could happen. But I read the text to tell you that as soon as he was born, trouble started. Herod was after him. The devil was after him. Listen to me. He had not done one miracle. He had not healed, no, healed any blind people. He had not. He just was a baby. He was born. But he was a threat. Come on, Holy Spirit. Somebody out there, you know why the devil's on you? Because you're a threat. He's after you because you've been born again. He's after you because you belong to God. Quit sitting around trying to analyze why am I going through this trial or why is this happening or why is this taking so long? Here's what God is saying. You need to understand, even if you figure out why you're going through this now, do you know that the underlying cause of everything you're going for, because I don't want you to lose fact of this, is you're in a war. Soon as Jesus was born, the attack was made. Soon as you were born again, that's when the enemy wanted to come in and take over. Do you know why the enemy's after you? Do you know why it seems like it's so hard for you? Because you have to fight. I'm encouraging somebody. Don't you ever get to the point that you don't continue to rise up and fight. I don't care if you don't have strength. I don't care how weak you seem. I don't care what the world is doing. I don't care. Long as you can holler out Jesus, long as you can reach for God, something's going to happen in your life. So I need you to understand Stand that you just were born again. Jesus was just born again. Soon as he was born again, all of the trouble started. God just sent me to remind you, please.
please don't forget your inner battle. Please don't forget your inner war. Act like a soldier, not like a wimp. I'm sorry, it's Christmas, but y'all know me. I have been under so much stuff that I can tell you God will give you the victory. Here's the first point we ought to find for the text. Know God for yourself. Mm. Verse 2 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came three wise men from the east to Jerusalem. You know, we read about these wise men, but there's some significant points in that verse that he just said. We read about the wise men, and of course, you've seen a lot of Christmas manger stories that show you three wise men. Nothing in Bible tells us it was three of them. All we knew was more than one because it says wise men. A lot of times we equate the fact that um, because they gave three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that it was three of them. It could have been five or ten of them. But anyway, also a lot of other facts that I don't need to get into because it's not that kind of teaching. But they found Jesus where he was, right? These wise men came from the east. If they came from the east, I need to give you an understanding. The east meant uh, Persia, uh, Mediterranean area, uh, Mesopotamia. It meant the area where Babylon was. It meant that they could have been leftover Jews or descendants of the Jews who were taken into bondage into Babylon. But these three wise men, and the word actually means when it's interpreted, it's the word magi. And the word magi just means that they were uh, wise or holy men, also astrologers, or they were uh, scientists, or they were biblical scholars. I mean, when they said wise men, it encompassed everything. But because they read the star in the east, watch this. Isn't this something that God allowed Jesus' birth to be seen all over? That's just something I want to throw in. Because the star was seen in the east, 400 miles away. But they had the journey to Jerusalem. And it said they came into Jerusalem bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when they found Jesus, they worshiped him. They fell down and worshiped him. This proves one thing. They, these three men, now we're going to go through the text. You'll find out that they went to Herod. Herod said, go find the child. They explained to Herod that the star said the king is going to be born. They called him king. They went, Herod said, when you find the child, let me know so I can worship the child. When they found the child, they bowed down and worshiped the child. But here is the blessing. Situation you won't worship. Can I at least encourage you, people who know God, know that when nothing else works, can I get a witness? Worship works. Can I get a witness when nothing else works? You know why you can't worship? And you know why you can't feel me? It's because worship takes you breaking that power of the enemy over your life, lifting your hands and praising him like you recognize who he is. Let me tell you why they recognize who he is. Gold, so they've given research. Look, the gold represented something that should be given to a king, even though they found him in a manger. Gold was given to a king. Frankincense Frankincense was this rare residue that came from the uh, Baswala tree. It was precious and it was used in worship. If you go into the Bible in the Old Testament, it was frankincense that was used in the ceremonies of worship. In sacred worship, they burned incense of frankincense. And then myrrh. Myrrh is what's used for embalming or it's used to cover. It's a perfume that covers staunch odors. So some people said the, the actual frankincense Frankincense meant that Jesus was worthy of worship, even though he didn't look like it sitting there in the stable or in the manger. And it also says some people understood that Jesus Christ was going to die. And that's what the myrrh represented. But here's the problem. They knew Jesus for themselves. And the problem with that is that everything God, please hear this, does in your life is you're going to have to have a relationship for yourself. They knew the prophecy about the king. So here is what they knew. Here's what you're going to have to know. You're going to have to know the word in order to have a relationship. Do you know the only way we build relationships with each other is through the word? It's by spending time together. It's by talking together. It's by being with one another. We can read each other's thoughts sometimes because we know each other so well. You got a friend like that, you know. How come Jesus, how come you don't know God that well? Do you know that God's word is the only way to build a relationship with him? When you come to me and talk to me about situations that, you know, that are around our friendship, I'm with you. We're talking stuff that we need to do together. But if you come to me talking some nonsense, I don't even know what you're talking about. Do you know a lot of times we go to God and we talk everything to God but his word? Listen to me. 
Everything God does in your life, anything God's going to do in your life, he's going to do by his word. Every move God makes in your life is going to be based on his word. Do you hear me? Everything that happens. So why don't you have a relationship with God for yourself? How do I know that? Because Hebrews 1 and 3, Hebrews 1 and 3, God says, I uphold all things by the power of my word. God's word. You have to know, if you want a relationship, the first way that you can do it is to make sure you know the word of God. God told, I love this. God told Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1 12, he said, look, I watch over my word to perform it. Here's what God is saying. I'm waiting on you to speak my word. You sick? I'm waiting on you to say, Lord, heal me. I'm waiting on you to say, Lord, provide. I'm waiting on you to say, Lord, get me out of this situation. God said, all you have to do is speak my word. Speak the word and I will come. What does the word say? That he's able to heal us, that he's able to deliver us, that he's able to bless us. God said, I'm waiting on my word. Watch this. Come out of your mouth and I'll show up to your house. I'm not even trying to be a rapper. Never mind. He's waiting on your, his word to come out of your mouth and he'll show up to your house or wherever you are and bless you because God moves by his word. You know, God says, I'm waiting and watching. Whoever speaks my word, I'm going to make sure I perform it. He takes this further in Isaiah 55 and 11 when he says that my word that goes forth out of my mouth does not come back void, but it will prosper in the thing that I send it and it will accomplish my purpose. Do you realize what? God said, put the word in you. God said, now that you got it in you, it is not void. It will work. Somebody here needs to hear that if you speak a word right now, can, can I ask you to speak what you need right now? Don't look, speak to God. Tell God what you need. Speak it, even though it doesn't feel right. And when you speak God's word back to him, that's when God bless you. If you desire healing, speak healing. If you desire whatever you desire, God said, you got to speak it. You remember our savior, now, Jesus had to do this, and he was the Christ, came down from glory, but in this human form, as much man as he was God, in order to overcome the devil, he had to speak the word. Know what he said when he got taken to the wilderness? Anybody in the wilderness today? Know what he said? It is written. Do you realize that all you got to do is find out what's written? Oh, here's a nugget, guys. Find out what's written about what you're going through. And I guarantee you, God can take you out because when the enemy comes, when your mind gets cloudy, you're going to say it is written. And when you do, you bring God on the scene. I don't have to help nobody out, do you? It is written. You don't have to worry about your mind going crazy or your peace because God said, I give peace that passive understanding. It is written. My God is a healer and he, nothing is impossible for my God. It is. So what you have to do is make sure you understand it is written. But the word, you can pray the word as Daniel did. Or the Bible tells us if two or three are touching and agreeing and we're in prayer. God said we can ask for what we want. Praying the word works. Singing the word as Joshua and the children of Israel were marching around the walls of Jericho. They were singing, great is our Lord. And as they sang, the walls came down. I encourage somebody, start singing in your house where you are right now. Start singing in your life and singing the word, sing the word. Uh, this is a day the Lord has made. That's word. This is the day. Sing it and let the, let the blessings of God. I, I contend that a lot of you have problems in your life because you're listening to me now, but you don't even understand what I'm saying. Many of you, you, you understand this little proverb that you've heard, and many of you are living under this proverb. I know you've heard it before, and we all will recognize it when I say it, but there's a proverb that says, if you give me a fish, I'll eat for a day. If you teach me to fish, I can eat for a lifetime. Do you realize there's too many Christians coming into church, letting somebody give them a fish and you eat at church. But when you leave church, you don't know how to fish for yourself. And sometimes what they're giving you is not what you need. What you need, I might not hit this morning. But if you know how to fish, can I get a witness? You know how to get yourself somewhere, get on your knees, get in your word until God shows up. Many, too many people are trying to let people, look, open your mouth. What's my, put a fish in. No, that's why you hurt now. Because you don't know how to fish for yourself. I tell people, get into your Bible, know the word. So even if you hear a preacher on TV, YouTube, wherever, and they don't hit it right, then you need to know that I know how to get, wait a minute, you'll be able to say, hey, at any rate, I know how to get it. 
Do you realize there are people out there, people are prophesying into your life and they are prophesying stuff over you and you just listening to it? I know people that run this way because somebody prophesied. Run this way because somebody prophesied. Wait a minute. How do you know it's true? The Bible says you've got to know the word for yourself. And God says, I will never let somebody speak something in your life that you have not Confirm first by the hearing of my word if you have a relationship. You better quit. Some of y'all just want to come fish. Some of y'all want to come eat. And there's two kind of worshipers in the church. You're the same way. You've seen them before. The worshipers, there's some people sitting here. You know, I get excited anyway, guys. So don't, don't worry about that. That's just who I am. But there's some people that come to church. Oh, my God. Head down. Hands down. Or they sit and listen to me right now all sad. Uh, cornflakes coming out their mouth. Egg sandwich running off the plate. Listen, all I'm telling you is this. That there's kind of people in church. You need the choir jumping. The atmosphere jumping. Somebody running around hollering. You need the preacher preaching the lights out. You need all that. Then you'll say, "Woo! Didn't I have a good time? That's, that's the one kind of worshiper. But then there's the other kind of worshiper. And I know there's somebody can identify with it. I don't need any of that. All I need is the right thought. When I think, I could be sitting in church, it could be quiet. But if a thought comes about how good, good God has been to me, have I got a witness? I will shout all by myself. A real worshiper shouts when they get the word going on in their mind. Some of y'all need folk running around speaking in tongues, hollering. All I need is somebody to say, Jesus just told me, or I hear, I hear in my spirit where God say, you're about to get out of that. I might start shouting. I might jump up and run around the church right there. That's the kind of church Shiloh is. If you hit it, you need to jump around and get it. All I'm saying to you is don't you dare sit there in your relationship and not realize that the word of God is how you build your relationship. And you need to understand something. The, um, David spoke the word. You ever, you ever thought about what David did when he went to Goliath? How he, how he beat Goliath? David used the words to face his giant. I got to move on. David used the, Goli he used the word to face his giants. Watch this. When Goliath came out, big giant, he came to David and said, oh my God, he was incensed. Am I a dog? He saw David with his little slingshot, you know. And his, Am I a dog that you come out after me with sticks? He said, come closer so I can feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. But you got to get into that 17th chapter of 1 John and watch my boy David respond as he uses the word of God. David said to him, you come at me with a sword and a spear. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God who, will, who you have defied, the God whose armies you have defied. See, David knew the word. God's title was Lord of hosts. He used that because he wanted God's army to show up. But listen to this. I saw this and it blew me away when I was reading. In that 46th verse of the 17th chapter, I thought David talked back to Goliath saying, well, you know, I'm going to feed you. That's not what he said. If you look at that 46th verse of the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, David said these words. He said, um, no, my God is going to deliver me, give me victory over you, and I'm going to take your head. But then David said, and I'm going to feed the army of the Philistines to the beast of the field and the birds of the air. Did you miss it? David was so confident, I thought he said he was going to feed Goliath. He said, no, my God is the Lord of hosts. He said, I'm using his word. I'm not only going to feed you, Goliath, when I get done, the whole army is going to be, do you hear me? The whole army is going to be fed to the beast of the field. David had enough confidence in God that he knew if I used his word, I would get delivered. Somebody say, pastor, what should I do? You should use his word. And then that 12th verse, here's the first warning. They saw this, they worship him, and then they were warned of God not to go back to Herod. I love it. They were warned of God. That means they had discernment. Stay with it. That's the 19th. That's the 12th verse of our text. I'm sorry. They were warned of God. And because they were warned of God, they didn't go back. They could have went back. Herod would have killed them and probably found out where Jesus was. But God intervened because he wanted Jesus to be born. Here's all I'm saying is they had a spirit of discernment. Discernment. Wake up, somebody. Discernment. It means that you have the spirit of God or unction of, of the Holy Ghost inside of you. And as soon as that unction starts moving, you can discern what God is doing and what he is saying. Or you should be able to. Please don't make me stop here. Don't make me stop and explain this. But I hear some of you thinking, here's what God is saying. How come? How come? 
that you have watched God defeat the devil so many times in your life. You've seen yourself come back from innumerable odds. You've seen God do things that you can't explain. How come? Why come right now? Are you sitting there depressed and the enemy has tricked you into saying, this is it. I got you now. Don't you have a spirit of discernment that said, if God got me out this last time, he can get me out. You just got to discern the devil's lies. God will warn you to discern. He's letting you know you should be able to overcome that. Some of y'all need the gospel of Nat King Cole. Y'all know I got to get one of these in. Nat King Cole, for all of my folk who love good music, there was a song that said, straighten up and fly right. It said the uh, buzzer took a monkey for a ride in the air. The monkey thought that everything was on the square. The buzzer tried to throw the monkey off his back, but the monkey looked at him and said, hey, Jack, straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and fly right. So then the last verse says, uh, the buzzer told the monkey, look, he said, look, you're killing me. I got to sing a second. Buzzer told the monkey, you're killing me. Release your hole and I will set you free. The monkey looked at him and says, uh, wait a minute. Your stories sound tempting, but it sounds just like lies. All I'm saying is you better straighten up and start. Look, lift your head up. Straighten your attitude out. Straighten your mind out right now and realize who you are. Straighten up. Here's what he said. I'm not falling for your trick by letting you go. Not till you put me down. The monkey had more faith than we do. You got to have enough faith in God to know when the devil's lying to you. And if the devil's telling you you lost, he's lied and you ought to tell him, I'm not falling for any more lies. I know who I am. God warned them. God warns us. You know, some of the things you're going through right now might be because you did not heed a warning. God warns us. What does he warn us? He warns us stuff like forgive and it will be forgiven. Uh, but some of us don't forgive and wonder why there's, tr I know, don't turn me off. Wonder why there's trouble in our life. He tells us that if whatever we sow in somebody else's life, we're going to reap. And sometimes we sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. All I'm saying is there's warning. God also warns us from danger. He warned the children of Israel, when Balaam tried to curse them. Remember, he warned them and he told them, he warned Balaam, look, don't do that. He said, you can't curse what I bless. He warned Moses' parents. Let's watch this. Remember, remember when Pharaoh was going to kill all the firstborn? He warned his parents to hide Moses because he had a plan for Moses. Remember when the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt? He warned and protected his children when Pharaoh's army was after them, putting up a wall of fire, right? And all I'm telling you is God knows how to warn and protect us. He's our refuge. And today the warning is for you to understand that he will protect us. I told you all this story before and I'm almost done. My, my father, I used to sing in a band. And when I sang in my band, we, we had a gig one night at a club called the Bucket of Blood. I know y'all remember because you remember the Bucket of the Blood. Now that night was the night, I'm the lead singer. That night, my dad, who was a deacon in the church, sometimes he'd get on his knees and pray for an hour in his bedroom. We didn't know what he was doing. But my dad came out out of nowhere and said, you can't go out uh, to do no singing tonight. God told me, I said, what? I'm going to get grown. I went there and put my clothes on in the room. This crazy old man. And I put my clothes on and I came out and my dad said, I told you, you can't go anywhere because the spirit of God, he said, wait a minute, stay right there. Then he went to the bedroom and got a gun. That's right. Spirit of God over here, but he got a gun over here. How many of y'all know those old folks didn't play? They live by that uh, old, old proverb that I bought you into this world. I'll take you out of this world. My dad said, look, you think you're grown up? Walk, walk out of this house right now. I ended up, after he punched me in the chest, I ended up going into the bedroom, taking off my clothes. Here's the moral of the story. That night, there was a shooting, a killing. A woman got her neck slit by a razor. And our stage, they didn't sing because I didn't go. We were, I was the lead singer. But do you realize that could have been a bullet for me, but God preserved me and protected me. He warned me through my father, who I thought, how many of y'all know them old folk had a connection with God. They had no internet, no Facebook. They didn't have all this housewives of, and they didn't have all these television channels and home box. They spent a lot of time with God. They heard the voice of God and God warned them and we had to listen. And my father got warned and God warned to save my life. Y'all might think it, think back in your life. There was a 
warning that came from your grandmama, a warning that came. You better watch this. Don't do that. That's God speaking in your life. Look at verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph. So the wise men left. Now we're at the point where God now said, I still got to save my son. In verse 13, he said, the angel came to Joseph and gave him and spoke to him in a dream. I love this. Another warning. Now, please, I don't want to get spooky here and somebody go out and build their own theology. The pastor said, God will speak to you in dreams. No, that's not the only way God speaks to you. He speaks directly to your heart while you're awake. God can warn you in a dream. You can be riding down the road and a thought, or you can be in your house and a little child will walk up to you and say something. And it'll be something that's an answer. Do y'all hear me? So God is always looking over us to what you would thought. You wonder, where that child get that wisdom? That warning was just for you. Or you'll see somebody uh, get busted for something or somebody have a fall over something and you're doing the same thing and you, God been protecting you by grace and God will let you see this so you can straighten up. So you can say, wow, I better quit. That could be me. Somebody ought to praise God right there. There for the grace of God, that could be me. But look what he did. Joseph, if you're going to take advantage of understanding God's protection, he told Joseph, take your child and go to Egypt. And when you go to Egypt, um, there you will be blessed. Here's what I'm telling you. Every believer, please hear me, needs an arresting encounter, arresting. God has arrested you. You stopped. Everything in your life is about to fall apart. God shows up. That's an arresting encounter with God. And at that moment, you know God is your only way out. Every believer needs to go through a trial. I know you don't like me now. Where the only way you can get out is God. Because then you will see him face to face. Have I got a witness? Once you see God face to face, when you're stuck in a hospital, when you're stuck in a situation that you don't know how to get up, you got a messed up relationship, a messed up divorce, your child is in trouble, and you get on your knees and God shows up, there is nothing better than to get you blessed. But you got to do what God said. So the second point is, not only must you know God for yourself, you must believe God is will protect you. You must know that God is trying to protect you. You must believe God is trying to protect you. Now we know Joseph believed that because this was not Joseph's first rodeo, but he believed that God was trying to bless him and protect him. And when you understand how much God loves you, it'll stop you from sitting around letting the enemy make you go through a pity party. Watch this. It was, we need to understand that God's love is so strong. Remember when Jesus said, um, um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I like to protect you the way a mother hen protects her baby chicks. It's talking about how mother hen, we, we, we might say chickens are, 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 you know, you can be a fraidy cat or you can be a chicken. Your chicken means you're scared. But no, the opposite of that. Uh, most, the, the chickens will protect their loved ones. As a matter of fact, uh, th there's a story that talks about there was a fire in Yellowstone Park, a forest fire, and it burned for days. It burned up everything. As they were going through the woods to inspect and look at the damage and fix it, a fireman came upon a burn to a crisp. This big bird was just burned to a crisp. And when he looked at it, he took a stick and knocked this charred bird over. Guess what happened? Underneath were three live baby chicks. Three live baby birds. And it was they were in a half-burnt nest. Here is what they surmise happened. That this mother bird, when she saw that the fire, she stood there and burned. Can you believe it? Sitting down on top of her chicks, making sure that they lived in the nest. She stood there and burned to a crisp until the fire stopped. And when they looked out, the birds lived and this, babe, this mama bird gave her life. All I'm telling you is, why in the world can't you trust a God that had enough sense that had enough love, that had enough mercy, that he didn't just die in one forest fire. He actually went to the cross, went down to hell, took the keys from the devil, death, and the grave, and put us in a place where we are now born again, where you are now one of God's chosen. You're sitting here alive because God has mercy over your life. Please understand, he is your refuge. 
He will protect you. Nothing's going to happen to you that God cannot take you through. And that's what God wants us to know, that there's nothing strange. You won't know God can protect you if you don't know God, because here's the thing that Joseph knew. Watch this. Just a text. First, it wasn't strange that he sent him to Egypt. Egypt was not far, and there was a Jewish colony in Egypt. You understand that? Community there. Joseph would be unprotected. You know, uh, they, they, wouldn't find, un, they wouldn't know who he was. Joseph could hide undetected. Joseph could hide. Joseph would be just seen as just another traveler. So God knew where he was sending them. So the first thing you need to understand is whatever, hear me, you're asking God for, hear me, whatever you're asking God for, you got to first believe it's not too hard for God to do. Joseph knew that God was doing right because God sent him to Egypt. All I'm saying to you is whatever you're asking God for, you got to know that it's not too hard. The reason we don't get our blessings is you give God this easy stuff that you can get a little shout off of, but you got to learn how to give God the hard stuff. And when you give God the hard stuff, it's because you now have had enough faith to do what Joseph did. When he got warning, he left immediately when he heard God. Joseph trusted God. So the first thing, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't strange that God sent him to Egypt. It's not strange that God is asking you, that God, you're asking God for a blessing, a miracle. God gives miracles. It's not strange that you're asking God, Lord, I, I, something didn't happen this week uh, that I needed to happen. It's not strange that you're waiting by faith on God to do it because you believe there's nothing too hard for God. Can somebody put that in the chat? Let somebody know. Nothing too hard for God. If you got a testimony, let them know. Nothing too hard for God. Let somebody know who's listening to us that you've seen God do a miracle. Bless somebody else's life by telling them, keep waiting. There is nothing too hard for God. Second reason Joseph left. I like this. Herod was going to destroy baby Jesus. That would have been unheard of. Why would Herod even know about Jesus? But Joseph knew that God knows more than us. Oh, Here's a good point. This is how we know God will protect us because God knows more than us. God sees further than us. God knows what the enemy is about to do. Can somebody say, I already escaped some stuff. I don't know how God brought me through that last trial. It's because through God's protection, you're still here. I'm here because God protected me. When did he protect me? When I couldn't protect myself. How did he protect me? I don't know how he did it, but the Holy Ghost stepped in and God did a miracle on my behalf. Are there any other miracles out there who can tell somebody Christmas 2021, God did a miracle in your life? And that's what God did. Joseph knew that. He believed in God's protection. God said, go. After the death of Herod, we're going into our last point. Don't, don't miss the fact that by him going to Egypt, following, watch this, this is very important. I, I think it's around verse 18. He fulfilled a prophecy. I can't let you get away from the fact that God's warnings come to bring us back to him because it's in him that our best life happens. So Joseph, by going, what if Joseph had never went to Egypt? He would have messed up Jeremiah's prophecy. Some of you are sitting there now. The miracle, the deliverance, the blessing has already been prophesied. All is waiting on for you to show up. Mm. God is saying, will you show up? Because the last thing that happened, it says, and because the prophecy was through Jeremiah that I will uh, call my child out of Egypt. If Joseph never took him to Egypt, God couldn't call him out of Egypt. How about God wanted to call you from a blessed place, but you never arrived in the best place? Listen to the warnings. I'm asking you to get some discernment. God wants to protect you and bring your life to a better place. All right, we're going to look at our last point. After Herod died, around verse 19. So first of all, I, I share with you, know God for yourself. Very important. Don't just eat fish. Learn how to fish. Don't wait on anybody else. Get your own prophecy. And then I told you, you must believe God. Know God will protect you. Know God for yourself. Know God will protect you. Write those two points down. And then the last part of this text starts at verse 19. After Herod was dead, an angel of the Lord came. Here's the last warning. This is the fourth warning. No, third warning. I'm sorry. He warned him. Go back. Herod's dead. Go back to Israel. Look at the text. Verse 20 said, rise, go back to Israel. Right? He went back to Israel. But when he got there, he found out that Archelaus, Herod's son, was ruling. And the angel came back and said, leave Egypt and go to Nazareth. 
God, what are you saying? Here's our last point. Know that God will direct you for the best outcome. I'll give you a chance to write it down. All three. Know God for yourself. Know God will protect you. Know God will direct your life for the best outcome. This is so important because this is where the rubber meets the road. You got to understand several things happen. God told him go back to Israel. When he got there, Herod's son was reigning and he was still in danger. And then God came back and said, leave Israel, go to Nazareth. It would seem like what some of us do. God don't know what he's doing. Some of us, here's where real faith is. God will direct us into some danger. Please hear me just to see if we'll trust him. If we will still have faith. If we know what he's doing. God gave two warnings. Some of y'all, when, when you get into trouble, first thing you holler is, oh my God, what is God doing? I don't know why God would do this. Look, you don't say it out loud. You say it in your heart and it kills your faith. You don't say it to people. Well, maybe you say it to your best friend, child. I don't know what God doing. I don't know. Maybe you do. But here's what I'm trying to tell you is this is one of the best times to be blessed when God sends you somewhere and it's not a safe place. Know that God will keep you there. And when God gets done with you, you're going to be better off than you were if you had not listened to God. Because what happened to him is he left there and he went to Nazareth. And if you look at the end of this text, he fulfilled the blessing that his child, that he should be called a Nazarite. What am I saying? Everything God does is to direct me to the blessing. So what if God takes the long way around? Trust him. So what? You know why? Because in order for you to know God will direct you to the best outcome is you got to live by your faith. Not other people's faith. You know what the text says? Joseph made both of these moves. When God said go back, he went back. When God said leave, he left. That means that he had faith. No, it means he had, I want you to write this down, personal faith. Again, you can't live off collective faith. Can't live off your mama faith. Can't live off the fact that my church strong. We got a faith church. Honey, that won't do you no good. Where is your faith? You got to have some faith in your own heart. Joseph could have sat there and whined, God, why are you doing this? But Joseph had personal faith. And the Bible lets us know that personal faith is what delivers us, not just hollering faith. What do I mean? The woman with the issue of blood did what she had to do to get healed. Now, the fact that, if we look at it, there were so many erroneous remedies out there to handle her situation meant that there were other women who had an issue of blood. But the Bible only records this one woman because it said she pushed through the crowd. She had enough faith to find not what other people said. She said, if I got it, I'm just going to follow God. I just want to touch because her personal when the centurion's son, I mean servant, was taken sick, he told Jesus, wasn't he with you? You don't have to come to my house. All you got to do is, listen to me, speak the word and my servant will be here. Do you realize that that is a faith? Jesus had to say, I've never seen so great a faith. He said, but I tell men to go and they go. I tell men to come and they come. You just got to believe when you speak God's word over your life, that power is going to happen in your life. What happens when we understand right in the middle or right in the beginning, God sent us somewhere it looks like trouble. Here's what happens. We get closer to God. We get closer to our purpose. And we get empowered to handle stuff. When I'm not in church, when I'm not listening to a preacher, when nobody's around, I am empowered to handle anything. There's some powerful people on this line right now, not because you look so strong to the world, but because you got a personal faith that says, I'm not going anywhere. Let me close this way to show you how important it is to have this personal faith. You've heard this before. Uh, maybe you have, but John Oakberg in his, uh, what was his name his book, Love Beyond Reason, he said, he gave this story. He said, there was a man who was falling off a cliff and by a miracle, he grabbed this branch and didn't die. As he was hanging there, he started hollering, Help! Help! Is anybody up there? All of a sudden, the voice came back. He said, Yes! He said, Good! Who are you? And the voice said, I'm God! And the man said, Great! I'm delivered! And God said, 
do you trust me? The man said, yes. Then God called back, let go of the branch and you won't be hurt. The man shook his head for a minute. And then he hollered back, is there anybody else up there? Do you know many of you have, is there anybody else up there kind of faith? When God does something you don't like, you get antsy and get to squirming around, thinking about what else can I do? Where else can I go? Can I tell you something? There's no place you can go that's greater than the place that you have now in Jesus Christ. Right now, listen to the warning. God gave four different warnings that brought a blessing to his people. All I'm saying to you is God loves and protects us. That's all the warning is saying. God loves and protects you. You don't have to be depressed this Christmas. You don't have to go down this Christmas. A new year is coming. God's going to restore you. And why will God do it? You're not going under. You're not going down. You're going to go higher. Why? Because God loves and protects his people and he Make sure that we don't get too far away from him without warning us. And he makes sure he doesn't let us go under. He doesn't let the devil touch us. He doesn't let the giants get us. He doesn't let the trials get us. Man, I'm getting excited all over again because God made sure. And the end of the story is the word was fulfilled. God was glorified and we were blessed. Fulfill God's word. Get closer. Your blessings and your, your purpose, your prosperity is in your purpose. Stay with God. No matter how bad the trial, he'll let you know when you're going the wrong direction. Know God for yourself. Know God will protect you. And know he will direct your life for the best possible outcome. This is Pastor Duncan saying, I hope you're blessed this morning. Uh, I thank God, you know, with this whole COVID thing. I know I had to go on. I'm coming from an undisclosed secret studio. No, nah, y'all, this is my dining room. But all I want to tell you is God is blessing today. Be blessed. Expect a blessing. Expect the supernatural because God is on your side. Have a great day. Hope you're blessed. Don't forget, we will have a New Year service. Uh, we're going to have New Year service. It will be broadcast, but it's going to be a live service from the church also at our Port Norris location if you want to show up from 1030 to 12 o'clock. We'll also be broadcasting as we step into this new year. Don't forget, God is making a better blessing for you. Pastor Duncan is saying, God bless you. Have a great day. I'm going to ask my um, studio team if they will turn off the broadcast and you guys can send this out and let somebody else know we were on the day. Oh, I'm the studio guy, huh? Okay, so you see me getting up and just cutting off the broadcast.